Welcome to the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Future Leaders is part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, focusing on pharmacy student perspectives, interviews, and the future outlook of our pharmacy industry. Um, Hi, this is Emily Henningsen. I'm a fourth year pharmacy student at the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy, and you're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast. Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I'm your co-host, Tony Guerra, for the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast, broadcasting from the Des Moines Health and Public Services Building at DMAX Ankeny Campus. Connect with me on YouTube, where you can find over 900 pharmacy videos supporting my audiobook, Memorizing Pharmacology. Today, we have our P4 student, Emily Henningsen, a PharmD candidate from Preston, Iowa, who is looking at both ambulatory care and clinical community pharmacy opportunities. She's especially excited to help patients with their continuity of care. She chose an academic rotation to impact students and learn what goes on behind the scenes as one develops courses and programs. Emily, welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. It is a little bit goofy. You're about 40 feet from me in, a, in one of the offices and I'm in a conference room, but I haven't figured out how to talk to people within the same conference room without getting feedback. So I appreciate you uh, dealing with the technical issues. <laughs> but uh, let's start with the first question. Everyone's leadership road is a little bit different. Uh, tell us what you're doing now and how you got there. Sure. Um, So like you alluded to, I'm from a small town in eastern Iowa, uh, Preston, um, about population 1000. So in high school, I wasn't sure what road I wanted to take. I knew that I wanted to probably pursue some degree in the healthcare field industry. So I went to a community college career day. And I remember walking around, I think I went and talked to some people who were teachers or who were um, maybe college professors, I I don't really remember. But the only thing I do remember from that day is talking to the pharmacist. And so I didn't really know what they did, but I knew that whatever she was talking about sounded pretty good to me. So um, after graduation, I came to Iowa and I pursued my pre-pharmacy kind of coursework. And once I got into the more advanced classes like physiology and especially organic chemistry, and I was able to make the connections between those two courses. So kind of the molecules in the body, and how if they bind in a certain spot, then this effect can happen and then it can affect all your organ systems. I thought that that was really, really cool. And so I thought, hey, if we do that, but we're talking about medicine instead and how maybe medicine can bind to a receptor or work in this general part of our body and cause this effect, I was like, I think that'd be something really cool. Um, And I've always liked kind of teaching and and helping patients too. And so I figured that that would be a, a pretty good career for me. So I applied after my third year at Iowa and then I got in and I'm just starting my fourth year as a pharmacy student so so we're, we're going back from your your high school and now you're there seven years later or we're six years and and some change later it probably went by in a blink you were just there you know at the career fair and then you went to college and now you're about to graduate so you're almost a quarter done with your rotations after this block and we've talked a little bit about the ticking clock this year How do you manage job, rotation, life, NAPLEX studying balance uh, as you're going through this uh, really fast uh, last year? Yeah, I I think we were talking yesterday about how it's already a quarter of the way over and I can't believe how fast it's been going. But I actually think the the work life kind of balance has been a lot easier on rotations. I know with my first couple, I was first, I did my general hospital rotation. And then here at this academic one, everything that I've had to do, I've been able to, for the most part, do while I'm at my rotation. So it's been actually kind of weird to come home at night, you know, at four or five o'clock and have the whole night ahead of me. So I'm trying to find my niche and decide what my hobby will be, I guess, as the year progresses. But but yeah, so it's been it's been really nice to kind of have some free time and to kind of just do things for myself. Yeah, we do the eight to four here. But what was the hardest part? Let's take it back just a step. What was the hardest part of the three years before your APPE rotation? So now you have eight to four every day. Um, what was it like just before you got here? Yeah, so... I'm pretty used to, obviously, with seven years of 
of college education, I'm pretty used to the whole school schedule kind of, oh, I have class here, class here. Um, And then pharmacy school obviously keeps you pretty busy with all the different organizations and then having a job on top of it as well. And I think that I stayed pretty busy. So I think that that actually helped me stay a little bit more organized. So even though different parts of each year were difficult, depending on the week or the, the time of the year, I think the hardest part was the couple of weeks or months leading up to this fourth year. Um, I've been a student for seven years and then, um, you know, 12 to 13 years of, of high school and elementary before that. And now it's just kind of, I'm going out on these rotations. I'm going to be by myself. I know that I'm a good student. I know that learning is kind of basically what I had to do with that. But now it's like you're, you have all this, this bed of knowledge and you have to try and use it. And then you're not with your comfort zone of your friends. And so I think the hardest part was just transitioning into this rotations world where you're kind of on your own and you're kind of putting all the things you've learned to the test. Well, let's skip ahead to this question then. So most P4s are essentially homeless. Um, I wasn't homeless. I kept my, uh, my place uh, in Baltimore throughout the whole thing. So I had my three friends. We were all in pharmacy school. Uh, but you are homeless. Uh, how do you take advantage <laughs> of the freedom that comes along with moving from, well, you're going from one side of the state to the other. You go from eastern Iowa to central Iowa to eastern Iowa to central Iowa. Then you have more of a kind of a smaller bounce back and forth from eastern central Iowa to eastern Iowa. But you're going back and forth. How do you take advantage of uh, all this freedom and, and going to these new places, new towns and all that? Yeah, um, I think it's really fun. So I'm obviously from eastern Iowa, so a lot of my family's back there, so I'll just go home. And then in Iowa City, I have friends that I can stay with there, and that's obviously been my home for the past seven years. And then in Des Moines, I'm staying with family, too. Um, my brother had lived here before he got a job in a different city, but but it's been really fun. Um, like, my first rotation was in Washington, Iowa, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump away from Iowa City. So I got to kind of continue to do the, thing, the normal things I did when I was a student in Iowa City, but I have been to Des Moines quite a bit when my brother did live here. And so I kind of know kind of what's going on here. So it's been nice to actually start to explore it a little bit on my own. Um, And then my next rotation is back in eastern Iowa. So then I just know that every night I'll come home and my mom will have dinner on the table and I can hang out with my cat and, and things like that. So it's nice to kind of the change of scenery every five weeks to kind of, oh, I'm back in Iowa City, I can do the college thing. And then, oh, I'm in Des Moines, I can kind of do something different. And then when I'm home, I can just kind of relax with friends and family. Okay, well, let's talk about home. You come from Preston, Iowa, which is a smaller town. We've had Brandon Gerleman, who just graduated, and uh, he said he was going to go work in Winterset. He does work in Winterset now as a pharmacist, and he's very pro-rural town, shop local (laughs) and all that good stuff. Uh, tell me about the divide that there is between the current opportunities in those smaller towns in the profession, but the needs that those underserved communities have. Yeah, so we had kind of talked about throughout my time on the rotation, and I'm, I learned it a lot in school too, that a lot of Iowa is considered definitely an underserved area. So I know that I'm, I'm sure that my my community is probably technically underserved if you're looking at it that way. But um, so I'm not sure of what the job market really looks like back home. I haven't really started to, to do that yet. But um, I just know um, in my small town, you know, your closest Walmart's 20 minutes away, your closest malls, 45 minutes away. Um, but out here in Iowa City or Des Moines, somewhere like that, there's a lot of different opportunities to be kind of a different kind of pharmacist. You can pursue hospital, you can pursue ambulatory care, maybe nuclear medicine if you're really into that. Um, and back home, it's mostly hospital and then pretty much small rural pharmacies. So there's still a lot you can do in those small pharmacies. Um, for example, Osterhaus does a ton of different clinical services that they provide. So there are those opportunities in smaller towns. Um, Some of them might just not be as well established. So that's kind of something that maybe piques my interest to, hey, if I went back home, I could maybe um, start some clinical services or or do something, especially in the communities where maybe your closest doctor is a half an hour away. Um, Try and do some things where maybe they, they wouldn't have to drive that far to see their doctor and they could just come to the pharmacy and kind of get taken care of there. Okay, well, let's transition a little bit to the actual rotation uh, here at uh, DMAC. And um, you can't really know what kind of a teacher a student's going to be before they get in front of the students. And uh, I had you teaching on the second day. (laughs) Thank (laughs) you for that again. (laughs) Well, 
I don't know. I, I have three daughters. Uh, two of them will dip their toe in the water, and one's already in swimming. So uh, I don't know. Maybe I just took that approach. But uh, <laughs> but you ended up excelling in all three of the categories of teaching that we have here. So whether you're teaching a cohort where the group is really tight knit, and so it's not you against them, but they're very close together, and uh, they certainly. Uh, or have a certain challenges with them. You've taught in a large classroom and you've worked with students one-on-one. So what in your background at Iowa or maybe otherwise uh, made you uh, a good teacher or you were kind of a fish to water? You're like Tegan where you just jumped in and, and it seemed like you belong there. Mm-hmm. Well, I might have wanted to dip my toes more slowly, but <laughs> I, I am. I think I am glad to get tossed in. I think that it it went pretty well. Um, in my background, kind of like I alluded to earlier, I always kind of thought, oh, maybe maybe teaching would be a career for me. And I think as a pharmacist, you get the best of both worlds because even if you aren't maybe teaching a class, you're always teaching your patients. And so at my time at Iowa, along with being a mentor to maybe incoming students, um, I also tutored. So basically when I tutored, it was students who maybe weren't doing so well in the class and so they needed some additional help. So I would kind of, before we set anything up, I would gauge kind of what they needed help on because I I at first assumed, oh, just general content. Um, You know, if they were learning diabetes, maybe they just don't understand the underlying pathophysiology or something like that. But then after I really got talking to them, I understood that the problem wasn't the content. The problem was that they didn't know how to apply their content to answering exam questions. And so when I had tutored, I had been tutoring not very many students um, in semesters prior, and I just kind of would make an outline and we'd just go through everything, which was helpful to them. But with these most recent students I tutored, the, the problem was really trying to figure out if I look at a question, okay, what's important? What do I need to underline? So so I would just make up practice questions or find practice questions through our textbook and kind of just meet their needs. Um, and so that was really helpful. So I think that that was helpful in the classes that I taught. Um, the first day when I taught, we realized that the it was a dental hygiene class. And even though they've had a lot of chemistry and anatomy and physiology, they haven't had a lot of calculation help. And so we were teaching them basic dental um, dosing calculations. Um, so I basically needed to assess what their needs were. And so that's kind of just how I how I went about the teaching, trying to figure out what, what the areas of concern were um, and then the best way to, to address that. So what's it like to be at the front of the classroom? It's all eyes on you, including, you know, I'm there sitting there um, evaluating to some extent, um, getting ready to give feedback. But what's it like, you know, if you want to give someone else, you know, kind of a taste for what does it feel like to be at the front of the classroom where, you know, here, the class is yours? Yeah. um, So I think that I didn't probably fully understand how daunting it would be sitting in my seat for seven years facing someone is a lot different than standing and facing the group so um the first time it was kind of daunting um obviously but i don't know i guess you kind of the, the way that i tried to lecture was just keep kind of like you had told me to do um to keep asking questions about the content so we were talking about maybe hypertension so okay class does this Um, in hypertension, do we vasoconstrict or do we vasodilate? And then getting them to kind of have have some sort of response and have an interaction. And so since you kind of led me to to do that, then they were able to kind of trust me and we were able to have a little bit more of a conversation than just me standing there pointing at a PowerPoint and things like that. So I think them interacting with me made me a lot more comfortable. So I think that was really something because usually every lecture I've ever had, it's not super interactive. And so um, I could see where that'd be really nerve wracking. You're just getting, you know, between 40 and 100 blank stares. So it was a lot better to see, you know, heads nodding if I asked a question like, oh, yeah, I I definitely understand that. Or if people looked confused, then maybe um, taking a step back and um, trying to, to work things out in a way that they can understand it a little bit better. What really impressed me was that by the fifth week or even into the fourth week, as you were presenting, you started asking questions that led them back to the beginning, and they were really getting a feeling of success, and it was more than just head nodding, but multiple people giving you the answer. Um, How did you kind of, maybe I should put it this way, what advice would you have for a student who wants to learn to teach? Because you picked it up really quickly. Um, that maybe they're a little nervous getting in front of people, but they want to get in there, they want to share that knowledge. Uh, What advice would you have for them? 
Yeah. Um, and I was pretty nervous when I started too. So definitely the first couple of weeks I would, I read that PowerPoint a lot of times, um, and just making notes and, Oh, this is a, a point that I think I want to make. Um, this is a question maybe I'd ask. Um, and so then, you know, maybe the first couple of weeks I read a little bit more than I needed to and asked some questions, but then I think you just get the hang of it. And then you definitely, I think most of it was you started to trust the knowledge that you know that you already have. Um, sometimes when you go in to maybe give a presentation or a speech or something, you're not confident. Oh, I like, I, I don't, if they ask me this question, I don't know if I'll know the answer, but just trusting that the things that I was saying, I knew that I knew. And I think that made it a lot easier too. Um, and I think definitely making that repertoire with the, with the students, um, it would have been a totally different story had I just stood up there and lectured and if they all were texting or, you know, not paying attention, but since they were engaging, I think they also made my time a little bit easier. So, so I think practice makes perfect and definitely just thinking, thinking about maybe when you learned it and you were starting to learn it, what you had to think about yourself. So for example, we did the sympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic versus the sympathetic, what are the differences, things like that. Um, I think just basically taking it down really low and then building off of it. And then, like you said, tying things back together in, in later lectures just for comprehensive understanding. Um, then students, as they saw that you were going to be there for a long time, and this is kind of nice that we have this multi-week uh, opportunity, how did it feel when students started coming directly to you for advice and help with their class? Now, I was sitting there expecting them to come to me, and they, they <laughs> didn't. So uh, on, on one end, I'm you know, good for you. But on the other end, I'm like, <laughs> all right, well, I'm going to have to step up my game a little bit. Uh, but how did it feel when the students started coming to you? It felt really, really nice. Um, just as I knew I was coming into an academic rotation, I knew there'd be a teaching component. And I had never, besides tutoring or maybe giving a presentation in, in front of a small group of my classmates, I've never really done anything like that um, or been really responsible for someone's complete understanding of a topic. And so to know that they trusted me and they believed the things I was saying and they thought the way I was presenting things were helpful, that was a really cool feeling. So sorry that I stole some of your sunlight, but, <laughs> but it was really, really cool. I like that expression. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it as my own. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, you made some, part of teaching is also giving them something that they can listen to later. Uh, there's always the problem of if you give somebody the PowerPoints and the recorded PowerPoints, then maybe they don't come to class. And we kind of talked about how now that you see it from the other side, you're like, no, no, come to class. Mm -hmm. But we also made some other things which are very public. Uh, you made some YouTube videos with the quads, uh, or what we call the quads, where you change the question and don't change the answers. Um, what's it like to get 1,500 views on YouTube? I know you <laughs> weren't terribly involved on social media before you got here. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I should start with that the quads were made with reluctance. Um, I'm not a huge fan of, of recording my voice, but they actually, they were super helpful in getting me to think about, even though I've learned a lot about, about medicine and, and drugs and things like that, really focusing on the differences between the drugs. And so even though it was a review for me, I found it really, really helpful. Um, and yeah, obviously by the, the views on YouTube, people are finding it helpful too. So that's a good feeling that, um, that I've gotten some some thumbs up likes on on YouTube videos, so kind of a little bit of reassurance with that as well. And no thumbs down. I haven't seen no a thumbs down. One. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, um, you know, kind of to tie into that. So we're we're talking uh, on the podcast, but you also interviewed a P four from Purdue. What was it like talking to another P four from another college, who is kind of working somewhat in parallel to you uh, with their own track, certainly, but. Uh, what was it like talking to her? Yeah, um, I'm really glad you gave me the opportunity to chat with her. So her name was Song Ah, and she's a fourth year student at Purdue. Um, so her route's a little bit different than mine. I'm kind of hoping to go into AmCare or a clinical community role. And she's really all about industry managed care and then um, potentially some teaching as well. So it was really interesting to hear um, what she was doing at her rotations, she had been with Novo Cure and Eli Lilly doing some kind of marketing, more industry-based things. Um, so it was cool to just hear that. And even just as we talked, kind of some of the things she'd say about Purdue and the way they did things. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really different or really similar than what we do at Iowa. So I think it was really just nice to hear that, you know, someone's in the same kind of 
boat as you, but in a, in a different boat as well. So we're both kind of sh- still trying to get the hang of these rotations, but um, even though we're in different paths, we're, we're kind of similar too. So it was really nice to chat with her and just hear about what things are like um, a little bit further east. So let's talk a little bit about the the new curriculum at Iowa has P3s coming into block eight and nine, and they can take elective rotations. Let's say that in before you go into your block eight, you just happen to be in Iowa City, and they say, "Hey, Emily, we see you've uh, been successful in most in your rotations. Um, can you come back and talk to these P3 students just before they take off to go to block eight and nine? Because you mentioned the two weeks before are a little bit awkward. You're kind of uh, in this kind of limbo, but now you've got a possible, you know, block eight and block nine where they're going to be in rotations and that, you know, comes very quickly. Uh, what advice would you give to those P3s? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think kind of like I alluded to earlier, just trusting what you know, I, you, you do know more than you think that you do. So I think that was something I struggled with right away. You know, maybe someone would ask me a question and I wouldn't answer right away. Um, I'd be like, oh, let me just, I think I know, but I'm not 99, I'm not 100% sure, which is good if if you don't know, you shouldn't say something that could potentially be incorrect. But just trusting that, you know, you got, especially Iowa, we we get a great education. So trusting the things that that you've been taught, you do know it more. Um, And then one thing I've definitely learned on this rotation is, I guess, um, jumping in head first. So like we kind of talked about, maybe some of the things where I was a little reluctant to do at the beginning, but I think that being thrown into teaching, now I'm more confident in my public speaking and my ability to to teach and to assess kind of learning. Um, and then with the YouTube videos, that was something completely different that I didn't know anything about, but you've kind of introduced me to, you know, you there, you can do your pharmacy stuff, but then there's also a lot of things you can do on the side. Um, you know, you can be an author or you can um, write CEs or, or different things like that. And I never really thought about all of the things I could do with my knowledge. And so it's nice to know there's a lot of different avenues, but so definitely trusting yourself and then not being afraid to jump in and try something new. From the teacher side or from the preceptor side, we know in about three seconds whether you prepared uh, the night before, <laughs> and it was clear that throughout the rotation that you were uh, preparing uh, in the evenings and, and making sure that uh, you knew your stuff. So I think um, just kudos to you in terms of your preparation and always being uh, here. I think if, if I were to pick one word that absolutely stuck out is that you're reliable. I always know that uh, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that putting you up there, I I can feel confident that my students are going to get at least uh, what I would give, but generally more uh, because of the time that you spend uh, during the day and at night. So I thank you for working so hard. Um, But maybe somebody wants to contact you, ask you some questions about these types of rotations or or what what you're going to be doing. Um, How do you prefer people contact you? Just my email is fine, which is my first name, um, emily-henningson at uiowa.edu. Okay, and let's. Uh, normally, these are quick questions, but I think maybe we can have a little discussion with them. Uh, what's your best daily ritual to keep your work on track? Um, daily ritual. I guess I use a planner. Um, some days you tasked me with quite a, quite a few jobs, which I didn't need to obviously sit and do all at once, but just kind of keeping on track. So, oh, this this lecture is Monday and it's Wednesday, but then I have to prepare for Tuesday, Thursday's class, so I should probably do that first. Um, and then kind of keeping a list of things that need to get done that are in a time crunch or then things that can just get done whenever they need to get done. So there was really no hurry in, like we talked about the YouTube videos that I created. So um, whenever I found a couple spare minutes, then maybe I'd create something like that. So I think just staying organized and definitely planning, you know, what needs to be done right now and what needs to be done in the future is, is a good way to kind of balance things. And you mentioned a ritual about kind of recovery, uh, the dog hanging out. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> so that's an important thing. I think that many uh, P4s don't uh, think about. Tell me a little bit about your recovery or how you uh, kind of just take it easy for a little while after. Yeah. So it's been really nice to be in Des Moines. I'm staying with my cousin in Clive. So it's a pretty quick drive home. But they have the most beautiful golden retriever named Lila. And so whenever I'm usually the first one home every day. So she's always always very, very excited to see me. So, so we've been going on a lot of walks. And so it's just nice to kind of go outside, not really enjoy this humidity that we're currently experiencing, but um, I'm going to miss not having 
her to be really excited when I come home at the end of the day um, after I leave Des Moines. But but yeah, so that's been a nice way to to wind down at the end of the day. Um, and just if I if I talk to her about maybe things that happen during my day, I know she'll she'll always be there to listen and not say anything back. So <laughs> I heard an example, uh, and I wanted to just talk about this recovery because I know that. I really pushed uh, the gas a little too hard when I was doing P4. I did 40 hours a week at what would have been, you know, kind of a high V, and then that would have been for free. And then I worked another 30 hours a week where I was getting paid. So I was pulling 70 hour weeks, and I really kind of burnt myself out. And I had recently heard a professor had one student hold a glass of water, and then the other student hold a glass of water, but then could put it down and then pick it up and then put it down and then pick it up to show that if you have breaks, you can hold that glass of water forever. But then that one poor student was, uh, you know, there's a point where they were, you know, giving and the point was made and, and it wasn't uh, anything unethical or anything like that. But, it, but basically that, that you do need the breaks and that maybe the first thing you do after uh, rotation isn't, okay, Netflix, okay, more Netflix, mm-hmm. you know, to, right. to really take a break and, and enjoy the time that you're having where you're having it. Um, this I was really excited about when you told me, tell me the best or worst college advice you've ever received. <laughs> um, so I, I've received a lot of good advice. I, I can't really pinpoint one thing that stood out to me, but some bad advice that I received. So I remember when I was first coming to Iowa, coming from my small town, I was kind of nervous um, just about if I was ready for a big town and if I was ready for the curriculum. Um, I knew that I received a, a really good education and my GPA was good to show for it, but I wasn't quite sure how the classes would go. So we have to take some placement tests at Iowa. Um, and some of my friends were trying to, you know, get higher scores so they could get into, didn't have to take some of the prerequisites, but I just took my time and did, um, did just, I didn't look at anything. I just did use what, use my knowledge. But so I actually tested into general chemistry instead of chemistry one, which would put me a little bit behind in the pre-pharmacy track. That's why it actually ended up taking me three years to complete that. But um, I just knew if I maybe got into a course that was a little bit too hard, um, maybe, you know, if, if things weren't going well, then that would maybe skew my opinion of, of Iowa and maybe maybe I wouldn't succeed. So so doing that, I was actually able to have a really successful first semester, um, which was really great. It, I exceeded my own expectations um, pretty handily. So I it was time to meet with my advisor to pick my second semester of classes. And she effectively told me that since I was from a small town, I could only handle 12 credit hours um, at a time. So that's when um, my fists became clenched, I guess. <laughs> and um, I was like, well, I'll show you, lady. So um, that semester, the next semester, I just took the took the three classes she told me to. But from then on out, I just kind of I knew that I knew what I was doing and I knew that I could succeed obviously in a heavier course load than, than what she thought that I could. Um, so I think that I guess hearing, you know, tell me I can't and I show you that I, I'll show you that I can. So that's kind of always stuck with me. Um, if someone's like, Oh, you can't do that. Or I don't think you're capable of that. Um, I'd, I'd really like the chance to show you that maybe I can. So, um, so that's always stuck with me whenever, um, you know, if, if someone maybe doubts what I'm doing or, even if I start to doubt myself, just to kind of trust that, hey, you you knew what you were doing that first semester when you were moving from a town of a thousand to a dorm of a thousand. So um, just kind of to trust my gut. So the first day I should have said, I bet you can't teach a class. Yeah, you should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> I think our I think our five weeks would have gone a little differently, <laughs> a little bit, oh boy. <laughs> a little All bit right. more angry. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get off that. So what inspires you? Um. I guess my family, um, they've always rooted me. They've been there. I played four sports in, in my small high school, so we could have teams basically. But um, <laughs> so they 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 never missed a game, no matter where it was. And it didn't matter if they had to work late or if they, um, whatever was going on in our lives, they've always been there. Um, and they've always rooted me on at school too. They're, they're my biggest cheerleaders. They've, um, I can probably count on them for, of my 1500 YouTube views, they probably actually have like 200 of them. (laughs) Um, they've really, they, they're so proud of me and they, um, it's just, I I just love them to death. And so it's nice to, I don't know, everything I do, I just try to try to do my best just because I know that, that they're in my corner always. So, so they inspire me to just every day, I guess that's where, I mean, I get it from my small town, but, um, that's where kind of the Iowa nice, which we discussed on my first day, that's kind of where I get that from. And just, 
just good hometown values, like just being nice to everyone. And, you know, maybe people are going through through things you don't know. And so it's just really important to, to be nice and to be a good person and to work hard every day. That Iowa nice thing, I learned really quickly. And <laughs> it was just the strangest thing. I was in line at the red box, you know, waiting to put something back. And somebody said, oh, I'll put that back for you. And I was like, yep. okay. And sure enough, you know, I get the email a little bit later, you know, and that was one of my first days in Iowa. So I just learned that very quickly. Now, unfortunately, I wave to people I don't know whether I'm in <laughs> Iowa or the East Coast back where I'm from. And back there is just a little bit awkward. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Emily, I wanted to not only thank you for being on the pharmacy podcast, but I know that our students have definitely uh, gotten a lot out of it. And, and you've just uh, committed your time and uh, energy to them. Uh, and they really appreciate you. And it's going to be, uh, it's always tough when uh, someone like you leaves and they say, oh, it's you. You know, <laughs> where's Emily? Where did she go? And it's like, well, she, you know, she's only here for five weeks. And we spend the first quarter of the class explaining why we can't bring you back and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I want to thank you uh, sincerely that uh, you really did uh, make an impact here. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for having me on the podcast. And, and this five weeks was definitely more than I bargained for in more ways than one. And I think I've, I've grown a lot from it. And thank you for, I guess, believing in me and, and trusting me to, to get up there and, and teach, teach, I guess. So thank you, too. If you're interested in being on the Pharmacy Podcast, Pharmacy Future Leaders, contact me at aagara at dmac.edu. We thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening to the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag Pharmacy Future Leaders.